Welcome to our journey into financial history. Today, we'll explore lessons inspired by Neil Ferguson's fascinating book and TV series, The Ascent of Money, A Financial History of the World. We'll travel back in time from the tulip bulbs of the 17th century Holland to the financial storms of the 21st century, uncovering invaluable lessons that bridge the past to the present. So let's dive into the ascent of financial wisdom. The Ascent of Money explores the role of finance in shaping the course of human history. It takes readers on a journey through time demonstrating how money, banking, debt, credit, and financial systems have influenced major historical developments. Throughout the book, Ferguson delves into the impact of financial innovations such as the bond market, stock market, and insurance in driving economic progress and, at times, financial crisis. He also examines the role of international finance and geopolitics and the formation of global power structures. The biggest takeaway from this book is the importance of understanding the basics of financial health, knowing the difference between assets and liabilities, understanding compound interest, budgeting, avoiding excess of debt, and the power of saving. Ferguson demonstrates his key ideas by sharing a wealth of historical examples. Within these stories from the past, we can discover valuable lessons to guide us in constructing a solid and secure financial future. The first lesson is from the Spanish Empire, a story of financial mismanagement. Their journey is a bit like a roller coaster, going from super rich to deep in debt. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the Spanish Empire was one of the wealthiest and most powerful empires the world has ever seen, primarily due to its vast colonies in the Americas, rich in precious metals, spices, and resources. As these riches flowed back to Spain, the empire's treasury swelled to incredible proportions. But instead of using this newfound wealth judiciously, the Spanish monarchy drained their coffers with extravagant lifestyles, costly military campaigns, and grand architectural projects. To finance their lavish pursuits, the Spanish monarchy turned to borrowing from European banks, notably from Genoa and Antwerp. The interest on these loans was exorbitant, putting immense financial pressure on the empire. As the debt mounted, the Spanish Empire's once great wealth was siphoned away. The flow of precious metals from the New World couldn't keep pace with the relentless drain of debt repayments and interest. By the 17th century, the empire was borrowing to repay existing debts, leading to further indebtedness and a steady decline in the empire's power and influence. The Spanish Empire's tragic downfall reminds us to live within our means, borrow prudently, and avoid excessive debt. They were like some super famous celebrities that can earn heaps of money but still end up broke. Loads of riches mean nothing if you have enormous debts. Herein lies a vital lesson, the importance of budgeting or vigilantly tracking your income and expenses. This way, you can avoid overspending, prioritize savings, and control your financial well-being. The second story is that of the Rothschild family, a prominent European-German Jewish banking dynasty that originated in Frankfurt, Germany in the late 18th century. This family gained immense wealth and influence through their financial endeavors, ultimately establishing a powerful financial empire across multiple countries. Mayor Amschel Rothschild, the family's patriarch, established a modest banking business in the late 18th century and placed his five sons strategically in major European financial centers of London, Paris, Frankfurt, Vienna, and Naples. They were early adopters of financial innovations such as government bonds and played a significant role in developing the bond market and financing governments during and after the Napoleonic Wars. The Rothschild's success had multiple reasons, one of which was a fundamental financial concept, the power of compound interest. Compound interest allows wealth to grow significantly over time by earning interest not only on the initial principal but also on the accumulated interest from previous periods. Over time, this financial snowball effect multiplies the initial investment or savings. The Rothschilds lent money to governments and charged interest on those loans. The interest, combined with careful reinvestment and patience, allowed their wealth to grow exponentially over time, allowing them to become one of the most influential banking families in history. Picture the Rothschild dynasty as a financial power plant, and at its core are three essential ingredients. Regular contributions, 
compound interest, and of course, patience. Regular contributions are like fuel for the power plant. Each time you add money, it keeps the plant running and the compounding process continues. The Rothschilds understood this concept well. They didn't just let their money set idle. They kept adding to their investments and let compound interest work its magic. Similarly, you can build your own financial power plant and let it multiply your wealth by combining regular contributions with compound interest. Our next destination is the picturesque Dutch Republic and the tulip mania of the 1620s and the 1630s. What started as a simple flower trade quickly became a speculative bubble with tulip bulbs at the epicenter. Once treasured for their exquisite beauty, tulip bulbs became the object of furious desire. Beginning in 1624 and peaking around 1636 to 1637, tulip prices in the Netherlands skyrocketed to absurd levels with some flowers selling for more than a skilled trademan's annual income. To us, the tulip might seem like a commonplace, unassuming flower you'd find in any neighborhood garden. However, in the eyes of the 17th century Dutch horticulturalists, tulips were regarded as exceptionally unique and held in high esteem. Ultimately, the tulip mania ended due to an excess supply and mounting worries about the market's sustainability. Within days, widespread panic gripped the market. Demand for tulips evaporated rapidly and the once booming market quickly disintegrated. Tulip bulbs that had commanded prices in the hundreds of guilders just weeks prior were now worth a mere 1% of their former value. The tulip market had gone from euphoria to disaster in no time. Tulip mania serves as a timeless reminder of the dangers of speculative bubbles. While the objects of speculation may change, the dynamics remain consistent. In recent years, we've witnessed the dramatic price volatility of cryptocurrencies like Solana and Cardano. These speculative assets draw investors hoping for quick riches, much like the 17th century Holland tulip traders. The lesson of tulip mania is clear. The allure of speculative assets without underlying value can lead to financial ruin. This historical event is a stark reminder of how market exuberance and irrational behavior can lead to unsustainable price surges, ultimately resulting in financial crashes. It underscores the need for prudence, due diligence, and a long-term perspective in financial endeavors, advocating for avoiding investments driven solely by hype or speculation. But how can we benefit from the upside of such manias without exposing ourselves to excessive risk? The key lies in prudent investing. It's essential to invest only what you can afford to lose. Speculative assets, whether tulip bulbs in the 17th century or cryptocurrencies today, should never represent a substantial portion of your investment portfolio. To manage the risks associated with such speculative assets, diversification becomes essential. Placing too much faith in high-risk ventures can expose one to the inevitable consequences when the bubble bursts. Our last stop, 18th century England, a place and time where financial innovation intertwined with human greed in a genuinely destructive manner. The South Sea Company's bubble in 18th century Britain is a compelling story of financial ambition and the pursuit of wealth akin to the 2008 financial crisis. In August 1710, Robert Harley, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, was confronted with a dire financial situation, with England buried under over nine million pounds of debt. Tasked with a solution, Harley turned to a mysterious figure named John Blunt, who in 1711 established the South Sea Company. Blunt's schemes convinced Britain's debtors to accept company shares instead of their owed money. The South Sea Company lured investors with a seemingly tempting proposition, a 6% interest rate and the promise of immense profits. They capitalized on their monopoly over trade in the South Seas encompassing Central and South America. Prominent figures, including Daniel Defoe and the King himself, got on board and the hype quickly escalated. Share prices surged from £100 in early 1719 to a staggering £1,050 by June 1720. However, in 1713, the South Sea Company's supposed lucrative South American monopoly was already worthless due to a peace treaty with the Spanish Empire that severely restricted England's trade in the region. 
The bubble began to deflate in 1718, accelerated by the loss of company assets in South America during the war with Spain. By 1720, share prices plummeted and the bubble burst, marking history's first major market manipulation case. The parallel with the 2008 financial crisis lies in the peril of overconfidence and the consequences of market exuberance. In both cases, people were enticed by the promise of extraordinary profits, sometimes based on shaky foundations. Like many financial institutions leading up to the 2008 crisis, the South Sea Company capitalized on the optimism, ultimately leaving investors with heavy losses. The South Sea Bubble, as it later came to be known, embodied the dangerous cocktail of speculative mania and financial innovation, a lesson that resonates with the introduction of mortgage-backed securities before the 2008 financial crisis. The 2008 crisis emerged from the dark corners of the housing market, particularly from the ominous realm of subprime mortgages. These high-risk mortgages were extended to borrowers with poor credit histories. They were bundled into complex financial products, including mortgage-backed securities. As homeowners defaulted on these risky loans, the entire financial system felt the tremors. In both the South Sea bubble and the 2008 crisis, the dangerous mix of financial innovation and lack of scrutiny led to catastrophic outcomes. This history teaches us that while financial innovation can be genuinely transformative, it can also be used to cloak risky and even fraudulent endeavors. It underscores the importance of understanding the financial products you invest in. Blindly chasing after the next big thing, whether South Sea Company shares or complex mortgage-backed securities, can lead to financial ruin. History is a treasure trove of financial wisdom, an archive brimming with lessons from which we can glean wisdom to navigate our own financial journeys. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, and until next time, make your financial ascent a remarkable one.